Okay, let's pray and get to the text because this is going to spiral into something else really bad. <laughs> Lord Jesus, thank you. Thank you that your people, Lord, we can gather in your name to be shaped by your word. So may your word, Father, move through us, body and soul, into the marrow of our bones, conforming us into the image of Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 So the plan, I'm going to just kick right into gear here, is, is to try to get through more of these subunits. I hope to get through eight. That's probably not going to happen, but I hope to do that. I do want to commend to everybody the book, again, to keep reading through um, the chapter of the week. We're not going to get through chapter two again this week. It's going to make it difficult. Everybody's welcome to attend, but it's going to make it difficult for you to process what's going on if you're not reading the material. So I just want to say that out, say that again, largely because Schmemann, uh, as I mentioned to Larry yesterday on the walk, he's, he's, a, he's a Russian Orthodox C.S. Lewis, and when it comes to the way he thinks, the way he writes, the, the, the weight of what he's saying is not conveyed in my regurgitation. It just doesn't, it doesn't have the same resonance. Um, and the, the, the difficulty, and I don't mean difficulty in a pejorative sense, but the difficulty is we don't think in his categories. Because we need to, as I've been saying, we need to re-Christianize the church. Christians don't know Christian doctrine anymore. You know, we just don't know what things mean. Um, I'm going to use Johnny as an example here. Johnny was, uh, you feel free if you like, you don't want me to share. But he was in, I'm going to have you share the testimony at some point. So, but he was uh, with Alex last weekend out at a, a, a meeting in, in Texas. Um, and got filled with the Holy Spirit, started speaking in, t in tongues. Never happens before. Wonderful euphoria, right? All that stuff's good. Yeah. And then the next set, what, 72 hours? Was it four days? It was three days. Three days of, of, you know, praying in the spirit that way. But then all of a sudden, there's this inrush of, well, God's telling me, or I think God's telling me to do, and I'll let you fill in the details another time. But so he calls me Sunday afternoon. And I said, well, Johnny, let me tell you, one, I'm not surprised that happened. I told you three weeks ago, get ready. I said, neither am I surprised that all of a sudden you're feeling very differently about everything. See, and so I said yesterday to him when we were walking, because imagine that's your Christian experience. So every six to eight weeks, you have another experience like that. And you attribute that, that experience to the Holy Spirit, and everything else isn't anymore. And what if you are growing in a church like that for 40 years? You don't know doctrine. You might know Bible verses, but you really don't know what the Bible means. You proof text everything. And you think that when that euphoria has happened, the Holy Spirit has shown up. No. No. And this is the difficulty I've dealt with in Pentecostal churches, is when I say to them, when you get goosebumps singing the national anthem, that's not the Holy Spirit. Which means when you get goosebumps singing a praise song, that's not the Holy Spirit. There's something about the song that resonates with your soul. Another example, especially in the Pentecostal congregations I had. If we sang old Pentecostal camp meeting songs like Power in the Blood and uh, uh, you know that kind of stuff, all of the people over 55, and this is 20 years ago, they, they would stand and they would raise their hands or they would sit and raise their hands and they would speak in tongues and they'd cry and talk about how wonderful the presence of the Lord is. But the moment somebody started praying, playing something contemporary, all that new stuff's not anointed. <laughs> but then the new people who were coming in, lips singing the new stuff, were like, this is great. And the old stuff would come on. <laughs> and you could see the split right down in the middle of the church. And each side's contending for their particular brand of music to be the most anointed. It has nothing to do with that. It has to do with your memory of previous experiences and the way that you were shaped psychologically in those environments that makes it easier for you to believe God. People, we, we don't get it. It's like, you know, if you are involved in deliverance ministry, we're going to get to the text. If you're involved in deliverance ministry and people start yawning, whew, well, there's a demon coming out. That's kind of how it goes. If you go into a counseling session and people start yawning, now that's the parasympathetic sympathetic nervous system that's kicking in because the person's accessing memories and the body is yawning to release the stress. Well, 
Which is it then? Because if you get involved in deliverance ministry sessions where there's not actually a demon speaking through somebody, a lot of the same phenomena. But it goes into this whole idea how we enclose our experiences and then we evaluate and judge our experiences on the basis of what we're thinking is going on. And so to bring all of that back around to the Eucharist, there are people then who will come forward every Sunday to the, to the table to receive the Eucharist, but they don't approach with faith. And so then they say, well, Christ really isn't there. I mean, this is just a memory. I'm, I'm just remembering that he died. No. No. But if you strike the power chords, and he'll tell you this, if you strike the power chords of most of the modern worship songs, like clockwork, the hands go up because the power chords were struck, not because it's the anointing. And we can't tell the difference. And if there's anything that most of us hate, it, it is the gift of discernment. It is the ability to really see what's happening. Okay? So, you know, when we come forward to receive Christ in the Eucharist, we are genuinely receiving Christ in the Eucharist. But the effect, how he's working in us, a lot of that is dependent upon where our, our faith, our living faith. If we approach unworthily, we approach without faith. Well, Scripture says we're bringing condemnation on ourselves if we do it in while we're living an act of sin. That has nothing to do with whether or not there's a Eucharistic miracle. So there's a whole lot in that, but I needed to, to, to bring that out because if you come approaching the text like this, and if your, your Christian experience has primarily been in an evangelical or charismatic context, the sacramental side is a very significant retreading that you have to work through. And think about the difficulty that, and Johnny could talk about this because, what, two months ago? We first got here, we were talking about, you know, praying in the Spirit. And he's like, man, I'm not really sure that's real. And I said, it is. Just wait till it happens. I said, and then when it happens, Johnny, we're going to have a whole different set of conversations because what's going to happen in you when it takes place so that I'm going to say, no, that's not the Lord. I've known a whole lot of... Pentecostal charismatic leaders who will not tell people you're not that's not the Lord. They won't do that. They will let them because who's going to correct God? Well, there's a difference between God and your response to God. There's a difference between God saying and you having a response to what you think God might be saying. And a lot of Christian leaders don't want to do that. I, I had a friend of mine, I need to get to this. I don't know who this is. I don't know who this is for. Somebody there, here, wherever. Um but she was getting ready to, she had finished college, wanted to be a missionary. She was in her early 20s and was going to go live somewhere out in, in the Midwest somewhere and participate with some kind of ministry. Or, I, I, don't, I don't remember all the details, but I know when I heard it from another a mutual friend that so-and-so was going to do this, like it came up out of the inside, it's a cult. So I started asking, so I said that to the guy telling me, did anyone tell her not to do this? This is, this is cultic. And um, he said, no, no, everybody thinks it's great. I'm like, no, nah, this is a cult. This, all, this shouldn't be happening. So we're down at a, as, at a meeting, a bunch of us again, like two weeks later. And Mike, you all know Mike. Mike's in the car with me and we pull out and we pull up to the parking lot and he's got his, you know, Mike. Anyway, uh, before we get out of the car, he looks over at the guy that is going to be run, that runs this ministry out there, and he says, Daryl, that's a cult leader. What's he doing here? There was no visible cult clothing. That doesn't exist. But when you're discerning, you, we don't want that. We want, I felt God. I'm going to do what God said. Now, I'm bringing that up because no one told her not to do that except for, I said, don't do it. Don't do this. Because, and I didn't say he's a cult leader because that totally would have been not heard. Right? She didn't go, thank the Lord. Um, last I heard, it's doing, doing very well. But um, we don't like that. We, we don't, you know, I, I can't tell you how many times I've been in a situation, especially in a church, and I'll, the Lord will move on me and I'll start to prophesy about that church. And I get done and I go, I go you know, I'm not an emotional guy, really, not visibly. Um, and I'll just sit in the car as I'm leaving, and I think, Lord, please let me be wrong. Let me be wrong. And I've seen churches blow away. Like, they don't even exist anymore after the Lord gave them words like that. And those are not things I'm happy about. 
I have yet to meet people whom the Lord uses that way who are happy about it, which is why I'm incredibly skeptical because I know it's one, it's fraud, and two, it's just plain deception on the person speaking, that if they can get up and they can really give it to the people of God, you're not a prophet, sit down and shut up because every person that's moved upon by the Holy Spirit to prophesy like that weeps with brokenness and does everything they can to see that people repent. They don't just come in and drop a bomb and thank God that they're so holy that they don't suffer the experience of it. But you want to look at what's running around unchecked in so many of these circles because there's nobody that's actually acting like a bishop to say, stop. And life after life after life after life ends up in shipwreck. And this is where the sacramental context of the church, because the church, if the church isn't sacramental, it's not the church. Not in a comprehensive, healthy sense. It's not the church. It's something else. I didn't say the people in it aren't saved, okay? But the church isn't just two or three people getting together. The church has an institutional, organizational quality about it. If you wanted to go down, yeah, let's say Adam and I decided we were going to go to the Moose Lodge, right? Right here in, in Rance. We were going to go to the Moose Lodge. But here's what we did instead. We went to Domino's Pizza. And we sat outside Domino's, which is up the street from Moose Lodge. And I said, isn't it great that we're in the Moose Lodge right now? Are we? No, we're at Domino's. What makes it the Moose Lodge? But you see how we do that with the church. Well, we're the church. Why? Because you got three people praying together? Well, he said wherever two or three are together or gathered together, he's there in the midst. Yeah, but that doesn't make it a church. It, there's a difference between a Bible study an evangelistic outreach, a prayer meeting, and all of that's good, but that's not the church. The church is organized. It always has been. It's never not been organized. And the sacraments create that organizational quality. They order our lives. If there is no Eucharist, there's no church. There's no, there's no sacramental embodiment of Christ's death and resurrection, because that happens at the Eucharist in a very distinct way that doesn't happen in other places. And that's kind of what he's hitting at. That, that's, that's the background of what he's trying to pull our attention to here. And I, maybe some of the reasons I was jumping into those things about mm -hmm. different charismatic ministries is in spirit-filled context and that kind of stuff, outside of the sacramental side of things, um, is because that is really a response to the emotivism that's dominated American Christianity since the 1940s and 50s. It's been around so long, we think it's normal. And you don't win people through emotivism. You can get, you can get converts. You can get a lot of converts really fast, but they don't, turn, they don't turn into disciples. Because discipleship says, well, you better figure out a way to get along with your spouse. You better figure out a way to manage your money. You better start taking up daily prayer, uh, practices of prayer and disciplines of fasting and how you do that in the context of a local church. It's like, look at all the people who, who don't engage in, uh, they don't celebrate Lent because that's religion, but they'll do a 21 day Daniel fast every year because a famous leader down in Texas or California said, God's calling the church to fast. Well, buddy, you're feeling that way because you don't fast Wednesdays and Fridays in accordance with the ancient church. Neither do you keep Lent. So how much of that is God, and how much of that is your response to what you're seeing around you that's a deficiency that you think should be corrected? But because you've been taught to think that every good idea you get is the Holy Spirit, as I just said to Johnny last, last, last weekend, ask anybody who tells you God's saying, God's saying, are you sure it's God? And then ask them, how do you know it's not an angel? Because the angels speak more to people in revelatory senses like that in Scripture than anybody in any charismatic or Pentecostal church I've ever been in want to acknowledge. It's the Holy Spirit himself that's speaking. The Holy Spirit told me. How do you know it's not an angel? See, there's no discernment. There's absolutely none. And it's all like easy catchphrase lingo. The Holy Spirit told me. The Holy Spirit told me. Then why are you wrong 80% of the time? Well, the person didn't pray it through. Oh, that's easy. That's the faith preacher. Well, you didn't get healed because you didn't come forward with faith. No. How about the faith healer who has faith be the reason the person gets healed? And not just the person coming up. What faith did Lazarus have when he was dead when Jesus called him back to life? 
See, we, we don't like that stuff. And if there's anything that the Eucharist really, and the sacraments really do, is they arrest the, 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 the disproportionate growth of things in our minds that we think are the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit's not, I mean, uh, the work of God is not ghostly in this sense, right? What if you went to get food and all you ate was an empty, like out of an empty bowl, like in Peter Pan? Remember that movie? The Peter Pan movie? When they're all going to eat out of the, the bowl? This, this, what is that, 30 years old now? They all go eat out of the bowl and there's no food in it until they start to pretend. So a lot of what happens in Christian circles is Neverland kind of things. It's pretend. It's the same thing. There's a difference between pretending and faith. Faith is based upon the real objective command of God and what he's instituted. So, amen. All right, uh, 1018. Okay. Uh, coming into to the end of four, part of section five, he points out uh, that beauty, you know, beauty isn't necessary. And when he was talking about that, I thought specifically about Judas. When they, the lady comes in and she breaks the bottle, the, the one year's worth of perfume on the board. And Judas says, why wasn't this money, why wasn't this sold in the money given to the poor? And John tells us because he's a thief. He's not really concerned about the poor. But Jesus doesn't deal with him being a thief. He deals with their lack of um, beauty. Like, they're not going to lavish something on him. So the, the fathers of the church, even Chrysostom, will talk regularly about the table and the, and the, 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 the vestments and the decorations and the beautiful constructions of the church to say, this is appropriate. We lavish all of this upon Jesus and the beggar at the door. See, it's not one or the other, it's both. So I thought about that. Um, I don't know if that came to anybody else's mind, but that's, that's what kind of got to me there. Uh, in section five, he's talking about the entrance. We talked about that a little bit last week, about how even when we get up in the mornings and as we're preparing to come to the church, uh, to gather as the church, this is when uh, this, this procession begins towards holiness. That's really what is going on there. In, in section six, um, he says, uh, like the third, second, second sentence, up to this moment, he who was the one who led the church in its ascension, he was the one who led the church in its ascension, but now the movement has reached its goal. So this is in reference to the celebrant, it could be a bishop or a priest. Or, but, you know, the processions come in, people have gathered, and then the, the, the uh, call and responses begin, because worship really is for gathering together as God's people is the entrance into Christ's ascension entrance into his entrance, his entrance into heaven as his body. You cannot separate the church from Christ. You can't separate the members of the body from the body. The Eucharist, even in the prayer, you know, as, as we're praying the prayers of consecration, about being part of the body, he and us, uh, that he may dwell in us and we in him. Because there's only one body, so we can't separate the members, in this sense. The priest whose liturgy, whose unique function and obedience to the church is to represent, to make present the priesthood of Christ himself, says to the people, peace be with you. Um, in persona Christi, is, in persona Christi capitis, is a Latin phrase for the bishop, priest, and deacon liturgically standing in the church. And that word persona, in persona Christi, persona, comes from the Greek word prosopon. And prosopon is face, mask. It was a term that was used for actors when they would take on a character. They'd play a role. And so in 2 Corinthians 2, verse 10, Paul says, I have forgiven such a one in the person of Christ. So the language is right in the New Testament where Paul's saying the liturgical movements of the church, when he has absolved somebody to come back into the church to participate in the Eucharist, He's referring to the events of 1 Corinthians 5. 
He's done it in persona Christi, in the person of Christ, meaning I don't have any authority to absolve, but Christ's authority. And it's a real authority. It's genuinely there. So that the, uh, the absolution that's given in every, whether it's morning prayer, evening prayer, in the Eucharist uh, celebration on Sunday, when the bishop or the priest pronounces absolution, the deacon requests it, so it's different for the deacon. When the bishop or the priest pronounces absolution, that absolution is as authoritative and as effectual as when Jesus says to the crippled man lowered through the roof, sons, your sins are forgiven you. That's what's happening. And the authority, this, this is why it was so scandalous to the Jews. Only God can forgive sins. But what does Christ do to the apostles at Easter? But give them the authority he's had because they are his body. See, we can't, we can't separate that. But we live in a world that, that separates it. We live in a church that separates it. That's why we've got to re-Christianize the church. He says, the, pre, the peace that the priest pronounces and bestows upon us is the peace Christ has established between God and his world, which is why then the church exchange, exchanges the peace. Okay. He says, the liturgy of the word is as sacramental as the sacrament is evangelical. The sacrament is the manifestation of the word. It stays bread and wine without the word of God. It stays bread and wine without the word of God. But once the word of God comes upon it, so to speak. Then it becomes for us the body and blood of Christ. Um, let's jump down to the end of section six, the last paragraph. This is why the reading and the preaching of the gospel, he says in the Orthodox Church, but it's the same, same for us, um, because it's part of the whole Catholic C-A-T-H-O-L-I-C-K, Old English Catholic. The old, it's a part of the whole Catholic history, of the whole church, whole universal church. This is why the reading and the preaching of the gospel is a liturgical act, an integral and essential part of the sacrament. This goes back to what, where we make distinctions about liturgy that are not accurate. And I use the Moose Lodge thing as an example. If he and I went to the Moose Lodge, there is a liturgy that's involved. We can't get in unless we're, right? And we can't participate in all the stuff they've got unless we're, right? If we go to Domino's, there's a liturgical act. You walk up, the guys behind the counter, the guys, they're all dressed in their special clothing, and they've all got the stuff they need to do what they're going to do. And then we, the, 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 and, and we order, right? There's, there's the call and response verbally. There's the exchanging of money. And then there's the receiving of the bread and the, in our case, probably soda. You know, uh, and then we, we go out and we eat the food. All of life is liturgical. There's nothing in life that isn't liturgical. Everything is. The UPS guy who shows up at your business and is able to walk right into the back behind the counter, drop stuff off and leave. People let him do that because he's wearing the clothing. Right? Everything is liturgical. All of it. There's no way for it not to be. Recognizing that the church is liturgical is to, is to be able to recognize why the Eucharist constitutes the church. We can't be the church without Jesus. And when and how is he manifestly present in a sacramental way so that no matter what we're sensing or feeling, we know exactly that he is. And because he is, it pulls us into his presence. Because... His presence isn't just what you're feeling, it's what you're feeling in your hands. The bread itself, the wine itself, those things are tangible body and blood things. It's really his presence. It is heard as the word of God and it is received in the spirit. So when John says that he was in the spirit on the Lord's day, a lot of commentators rightly note he's talking about a visionary experience. But large, larger picture, larger uh, uh, biblical, canonical, Genesis to Revelation picture, to be in the Spirit is to be in the church. Because the Spirit isn't outside the church in this sense. It doesn't mean God can't do whatever he wants. I'm not talking about that. 
But it means that in the church, when, when we are gathered as the church, that's where the Spirit's activity is. What? I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. There's our Old Testament. What's next? I believe in all of that. I believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. And you, you look at the Apostles' Creed, look at the Nicene Creed. All of those confessions of faith after I believe in the Holy Spirit are declarations of what the Holy Spirit does. So you want to be in the Spirit, be in the church. Because the next manifestation that the Holy Spirit works in the earth is the body of the church, the body of people physically assembled. Your resurrection will be physical. The physical body will rise. I was in a Pentecostal church, like I said, and people that had been in that church 60 years, half of them thought the resurrection was spiritual. No, it's physical. You physically rise from the dead. The Eucharist is physical. Yes, it's spiritual, but it's physical. There's a physical eating and drinking. Right? It's the abnormal thing to do and to receive the body and blood of Christ without the Eucharist. It's the abnormal process to be in the Spirit and not to be in the church. But if we are always thinking of the Holy Spirit's work as some sort of special manifestation, well, I want you to think of what's, if that's the case. That means probably two-thirds of world Christians right now aren't really Christians. They're not. They're not saved. And it means that most of world Christianity since the beginning, since about 400 AD up until 125 years ago, 175 years ago, weren't really Christians. And if you study the theological trajectories that really started getting promoted with restorationism in the mid-1800s, that's exactly what they started saying. The church died in the Dark Ages. The church stopped. Everybody fell away. There was a massive apostasy. And then thank God for those pre-Reformation leaders, and thank God for Luther, and thank God for Wesley, and thank God for the restoration of the healing, for the baptism of the Holy Spirit in Azusa Street, then the healing gifts in the 40s and 50s, and then the restoration of the office of the, uh, of the evangelist in the 1960s, of the prophet in the 1970s, and of the apostle in the 1980s. So now that we finally got the full gospel in, in the church, how arrogant is that? But go into any Christian bookstore and pick up a book by a charismatic leader that's leading in a charismatic movement today, and that's what's in it. That can never and would never develop if the church stayed sacramental. Again, it doesn't mean those people aren't Christians. You understand what I'm saying? But look at the net effect of that and what that's going to create. Um, It's 10.30. We didn't get into 7. That's my fault. I realize that. Um, the next section, so next week, let's plan on 7, 8, 9, maybe 10, because they're all, uh, 7, 8, 9, and 10 are very much the same thing. Mm -hmm. he's, he's just, he's unrolling ideas. It's going to, instead of uh, segmented pieces like we've been doing, the next several sections unroll a lot easier um, than the previous. So uh, we will take a minute or two for questions. Yes, sir. Why is he putting so much emphasis on the church building? He said time after time after time, you go into the church and unless you go into the church, you're not going to meet the Holy Spirit. I am not familiar with what you're citing. No. Um, it's all through this thing. I know he's emphasizing the gathering. No, here, here, let me just see. His glorification is known only through the mysterious death in the baptismal font through the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Right. That's the only way he's saying, well, where do you find it? It's in the church. Oh, I see. And, and, and okay. then you go back right. where you're just talking now. Yeah. The altar thus is the sign that in Christ we have been given access to heaven 
that the church is the passage to heaven. Yes. The church, the church, the church. Now, he's not, he doesn't seem in the reading of this that it's the group of us that are here, because if we are meeting at your home, um, that would be the church. But he's talking, when I'm reading this thing, about buildings. So buildings would necessitate some of that. I mean, if it's well, in a house, you're in a building. If you, if you go back historically, Luther left, quote, the church, which... No, he didn't. Luther was yeah. kicked out by the Pope. He was, well, yeah. But. So, and that was because Luther would not budge on anything. Like, no, the man but, was... But, but where were they going? They were going, quote, to the church. It was the organized... Luther was protected by uh, Prince Frederick the Wise, I okay. believe. Frederick, Frederick something like that. And so he hid in the castles while he was translating yeah. the New Testament, right? Yeah. But as soon as that's over, there was a deal that was struck. So the Lutherans, um, they had their own buildings. Yeah. Yeah. So there was so buildings is not what he's <coughs> emphasizing, although you cannot escape architecture in the faith in any place in history. And that kind of goes back to where even contemporary, look at the way buildings started to be built in the United States uh, after World War One. Like artistry really changed. Things turned into like just blocks, right? Like there's no more Gothic architecture. There's not even, what, the, what, is, the, what is the term for the, um, like the old wood and stuff? Or what is that? Like old world, right? That kind of thing. Like people don't, that's not common anymore. Uh, uh, cobblestone, all the stuff that, that like think just pre-colonial. Modern architecture has not been the most eye-appealing construction. And that reflects the underlying philosophy and theology of many people. Salvation is primarily spiritual, and it's supposed to be left off to the side of the world, and it's not supposed to engage with our regular activities unless it's making you a better person. And that's how he opens the book. And he's writing that in the, he's saying that in the 1960s, that your relationship with God is okay as long as it makes you a better person person uh, civilly, like you're, you're, you're more civil, you, you get along better, you, you have faith and hope to get through your daily struggle at work. That's not the gospel. But that's been what's been preached and taught for so long that that's, that's, that's what I'm saying. We have to re-Christianize the church and why you can't separate the church from Christ. If you can separate the church from Christ, then you can be Islamic. Because that means the covenant didn't work. God's covenant didn't work that he instituted with Christ. And the covenant is diatheke. This is the New Testament. This is the new covenant in my blood. So if that didn't happen, if you can separate Christ and the church, if you can make them separately, you can divide them, if you can divorce them, that's Islamic theology. That's Islam. Islam says that the covenant didn't work in the same way that the old covenant didn't work with Israel, and we are the fulfillment of God's promises in the earth. Nothing exists independently. We have to re-Christianize the church. So, it is 1035. We've got to stop. Um, but this is, why, this is one reason, another reason why I selected a book that is not typically in the vein of thinking, in the categories of thinking most of us use. Because these are the kinds of things that we wouldn't, like if we did, uh, as much as I love, pick any theological writer that's popular right now that's, that's really good, uh, we wouldn't get into this because they're not approaching it. They're approaching it in the same categories of thought that we're accustomed to. And if we don't ever press those lines, we're not going to see the full scope of the church. Amen. 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 All right.